Dusty black coat with a red right hand. This week on Detecting the Marvelous, we talk Hellboy Volume 1. Uh, so this is a special episode. I have an, a, an amazing special guest today. Uh, welcome to Detecting the Marvelous. I am joined by my brother, Nick. So, Nick, Hello. welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I've never done a podcast um, before, so this should be should be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, first time for everything. Once you start, it's hard to stop. I mean, I've got a minor podcast addiction at this point. Like I'm on five, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's it's a you know it's 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 the crack cocaine of midlife crises. Um, but <laughs> yeah. better than buying a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, only slightly less dangerous. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, before we start getting into help. Um, I, I, you love comics. I know this. What were some of your earliest comics that you really that you started reading, uh, and 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 uh, entered the comic world with? Oh wow! Um, yeah, I used to sneak into your room um, and steal your comics. Um, it was <laughs> old issues, uh, old issues of the New Mutants. Um, that number X Men number one with Jim Lee and Chris Claremont back in the day um Mm -hmm. the first comic book i think i remember owning for myself was a thundercats comic from star um that shows how old i am now uh Uh but yeah uh it's i've always been like more of a marvel (laughs) guy um so yeah that's really Mm -hmm. where i started out spider-man was always my jam x-men uh dc here and there but yeah it's always just mostly marvel Awesome. Um, do you have so is Spider Man your favorite comic book you'd say, or do you have another that's your favorite? Um, I don't. I don't read a lot of of as you know hipster as this sounds. I don't really read a lot of mar- mainstream stuff now anymore. Um, Spider Spider Man will always be my favorite superhero, but uh, the stuff that they've been putting out the past couple of years just hasn't appealed to me as much. Uh, I like. Um, like mm-hmm. I said, like I all, I'll always love Marvel and I'll always love uh, the characters, but just I'm finding a lot of the more of the interesting stuff in the less mainstream. God, it makes me sound so pretentious, but um, yeah, like that's how kind of <laughs> kind of how I fell into Hellboy in the first place was um, a lot of the the stories in comic books and in, in like the mainstream stuff, like the DC and the Marvel uh, stuff uh just felt played it's the same stuff over and over and over again with micro yeah. reboots new number ones all the time so i just kind of got tired of that and i wanted to see something or try something different uh that's why a lot of this stuff like image uh i i really dig a lot of stuff at over at image um dark horse puts out a ton of great stuff so just um more of the indie stuff nowadays or if you can even call those publishers indie compared to like some of the, f- the free press stuff that you get online. But cool. yeah. I mean, I, I had a similar experience uh, for me. It was uh, age of apocalypse um, that, that did me in it. And then I sort of found Sandman and uh, mm-hmm. that sort of brought me into the world of sort of alternative comics. But uh, it's funny, you, you snuck in and took my comics and uh, Tash, our sister, snuck in and took my CDs. So it turns out <laughs> I was cooler than I thought. Um, you heard which is it funny here. Because I, uh, my... Which is funny because I would steal Tash's CDs, which it turns out that I'm just stealing your stuff after all. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's recycling. It's all just recycling. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so I mean, you answered my next question. Um, how do you find Hellboy? When, when did you find Hellboy? Like, when was uh, when did uh, like was there a point that you're just like I'm done with the the the, the Spider Mans and the X Mens and stuff, or or uh, was, um, was it just gradual? I, it was more like a gradual thing, honestly. Um, 
like I started reading Hellboy right around Conqueror Worm, which was ooh, like 97, 98. Um, could be a little off there on my numbers, but um, yeah, it was around that point. And then Hellboy stuck consistently for me. Like it was always, there's Hellboy stories and there's like BPRD Mike Mignola stories of varying quality, but they're never bad. Um, whereas like if you read a bad Spider-Man or if you read a bad X-Men issue, it's bad. Like there are some things <laughs> that get published by the big two that are just cringy as hell. Um, like I, you know, I mean, there was the DC KFC crossover uh, supplemental thing that was came out a few years back, but it just, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. I think part of it, yeah, it's just if a lot of it came to, I got tired of the same old stuff uh, in in the mainstream stuff, and then Hellboy was just always good. A big part of it also comes from it's one. Per- there's a lot of hands that go into making the Hellboy. Uh, Hellboy is a part of a larger uh, shared universe called the Mignolaverse, uh, after Mike Mignola, the creator. Mm-hmm. Um, but he has his hand in every single story. Well, he while he doesn't necessarily script it, he comes up with the story ideas. Um, he does the preliminary character design work with the artist on the book. So regardless of who's drawing it, it feels like a Mike Mignola illustration uh, or design, at least, excuse me. Um, so there's a consistent it's, it's voice. It's like, yeah, I was going to say like this compared to like X-Men or what or, or Sp- uh, Spider-Man or any of the DC comics. It, it's it's his vision, um, whereas yeah. like you look at like that, the latest Age of Krakoa stuff, which straight up turned me off the x-men entirely it started as an interesting concept and then got so weird i was just like no they've just messed with these characters that i love too much i mean like if you like it more power to you but just not for me uh but at least with with yeah. hellboy I mean, and the, the 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 magnolia universe stuff it it's it's all the same part in it right yeah yeah like um you're you know, going into a Hellboy book, like there's going to be twists and turns, but you know, you're getting a, a Hellboy book or BPRD or um, Witchfinder, uh, any of the spinoffs of the, of the books. Um, like, you know, especially with the Hellboy stories, it's like so many of them could just be cookie cutter almost. Cause it's just like Hellboy travels somewhere to investigate something. There's a weird monster. He fights it. Punchline at the end. Like that could be it, but they're never boring. That's, that's the funny thing. Like I, yeah. I've read every single thing in the Mignola verse uh, multiple times and it's, it's never dull. And that's what I like about it. Um, it's just always a fun kind of romp. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some, some, like I said, some better than others, but they're never bad. Yeah. One of the things I find interesting about it too is it kind of like i mean he draws a lot of inspiration from lovecraftian stories and the way that he does it when he collaborates is a lot like you know lovecraft without the being a horrible racist monster um (laughs) it's it's like he he talks it out he works with his collaborators because you know like conan the Conan stories were in the same, were in a Lovecraftian universe. They are the ancient history of the Lovecraft universe. Like all he, all of those love early Lovecraft writers were buddies of, uh, or a Lovecraftian writers, like Howard and and stuff were were these friends of H.P. Lovecraft, and they talked it out, and and you get the same kind of creative process here, and it, it shows because you have that vision, you have that consistent tone even if there's minor differences from project to project it, it still feels the same i find the turtles are the same in a lot of the of, of their projects because like laird and eastman remain consistently involved as well even if they aren't completely hands-on they they have um at least their attention is on it yeah um with the comic books especially like 
Um, I think Laird took a buyout and uh, like years back, and he doesn't really do much with it. But uh, Kevin Eastman mm-hmm. is still, uh, at least with the IDW stuff, uh, I believe he's still considered publisher, or at least uh, story editor or something along those lines. Because yeah. he still works very much with um, Sophie Campbell. She just finished up her run, which was a really good run. Uh, and then, uh, forgive me, I'm forgetting the writer's first name, but Waltz uh, was the the guy who started this most recent uh, Ninja Turtles run. And he, yeah, it it's him, Kevin Eastman, and then it was Sophie Campbell and Kevin Eastman. And I think now going to the Jason Aaron run, it'll still be Kevin Eastman participating. So I think, yeah, like, I think that's part of why, yeah, like... Um, independent creator owned stuff tends to appeal to me more just because there is the consistent voice of people who are wanting to do it. Not that I'm saying mainstream comic book writers don't want to do their job. Cause I mean, who wouldn't want to write Superman? Like that's like any comic yeah. book fans dream, but you don't know what you're going to do. It's not going to be under undone six weeks after you're done your run. Like some new writer comes in and completely just, wipes the clears the table like the Krakoan age of x-men like you look at what's coming out with um uh the new creators on the book post fall of x and it's all like yeah the mansion is back in some capacity they're all mutants are back in the regular world and Krakoa is done which is like there's always a status quo to return to it's like oh I equate it to like Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Deep Space Nine was a long form story that like told something and there was consequences in each episode. Voyager, everything returned to the status quo at the end of the episode, whether that was like the year of hell or the weird lizard babies, they're just never mentioned again. <laughs> so like Hellboy yeah. has consequences. Like going into the Seat of Destruction, the first volume, it sets up everything unknowingly like you don't know going into it that this is all going to be big parts of other things so it's like and that's appealing that's really literally this the seed of the seed of the story um yeah exactly planted. exactly yeah uh well yeah yeah what, what i'm gonna do is i'm just gonna give a little bit of history here uh, about hellboy and and mike uh, mcnola uh and then we'll talk about the plot of seeds of destruction um cool. okay so Created by California-born comic creator Mike McNola, uh, whose list of awards is honestly too long to go into, but it's everything from an Eisner and an Eagles to Harvey's and an Inkpot. Um, His earliest work was illustrating the comic reader before scoring a job on Red Sonja. He is a CalArts grad um, with a BFA in illustration, which I feel kind of shows in his distinct visual style. Um, it's very graphically de- sort of pushed. Um, he, in, in one interview, he, he mentioned, uh, I am thinking about color all the time, sometimes as far back as the plotting sequence. Uh, one of his most famous works uh, being the cover of Batman's A Death in the Family. Uh, he felt that was just a contract job. And uh, he's always um, uh, sort of taken aback when people ask him questions about it because he's just like, well, I don't know. It's just something I did. Um, his more interesting work um, in the in the DC world is like Gotham by Gaslight, where he drew from sources as diverse as Tim Burton's Batman uh, to the man who laughs, whose wind plane was the inspiration for the original Joker. Uh, but we're here to talk about Hellboy, the best paranormal investigator of all time. The big red boy from the BRP, or BPRD. Uh, appearing in a couple of Comic-Con one-shots in 1993, he debuted formally in 1994, uh, issued by, uh, sorry, published by Dark Horse uh, in March, the March to June release. So this is, makes him a 30 years old uh, right now, uh, Seeds of Destruction's run uh, is right in its the middle of its 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 thirty year anniversary of its release. Um, his striking design went through several incarnations uh, and refinements before we landed on the design we have today. 
He started as a 1991 drawing for the Great Salt Lake Comic Con uh, before developing into a team. But Mike found Hellboy was just too darn interesting, and he couldn't think of any of any cool names to go with the rest of the members, so he just made it a solo comic. Um, originally conceived as a shared universe with John Byrne and uh, Art Adam, uh, sorry, John Byrne, who helped script some of the stories. Art Adams' work was also supposed to be a part of the universe, all under Dark Horse's Legends imprint, hence the presence of Torch of Liberty and Seeds of Destruction. This was quickly jettisoned when they all realized the logistical nightmares, uh, but also the creative restrictions that would cause. Uh, they quickly spun off into their own universes, with future crossovers being written out or omitted in reprints where possible. Uh, in an interview, Mike said, when I started the Hellboy series way back when, I wasn't really thinking consciously about the humor, but Hellboy does have a lot of my personality, and that's an important part of my personality. So yeah, so that's that's a bit of a history there. Uh, I mean, Mike's a really interesting creator in that he 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 uh, I, he's very graphic design oriented. I find that like that Cal Arts vibe. Uh, really runs through, but in a good way. I mean, I'm not anti. There's a lot of people who are like, "Oh, Cal Art style." Blah. I'm not one of them. I, I but uh, I, I find his his attention to sort of illustration and 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 the graphical imprint on the page is kind of revolutionary. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I as a wannabe comic book artist myself, I, I aspire to Magnola. Like to ape him, to ape his start style is next to near impossible because just the amount of thought and the most basic things that he does uh, is almost impossible to copy. And uh, yeah, he is so. We'll get into his art a little later when we talk about more about the first issues of Hellboy, but like he is unparalleled in what he does. Mm -hmm. It's It's kind of neat because that was a, in those the um early 90s there it really did feel uh like you know the the mystery limited run or the max that there were a lot of people pushing art styles in different directions that weren't common um up until that point that they they were sort of outside of that um but all in the service of the narrative which is so seldom done um, so yeah, so let's talk about the plot. Um, so we have evil Nazis. I mean, that's always a good sign when they're evil. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they're tr trying to run some ritual and, uh, in, in Scotland, uh, they summon, a, 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 a demon baby. Um, but due to, gas like ghostly interference he actually appears elsewhere and is adopted by uh, a professor and raised to be a paranormal investigator um so so like so this first is a very it's it's an interesting start because they set up you know Rasputin uh at the very beginning they set up these um these these Nazi villains, um, and they kind of lay the groundwork for the mythos, but they don't really like. It's a four four issue sort of arc, but they leave a lot of mystery there, which is really cool. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, um, he did. He, Seed of Destruction starts in like an interesting way because those familiar with the Guillermo del Toro version. Um, or even to a lesser extent, the um, uh, the most recent Hellboy, where it's just like Hellboy appears amidst the Nazis and then the American soldiers fight um, fight the Nazis to get Hellboy. Essentially, that doesn't happen in in the comic. It's yeah, it's it's almost confusing to the point where it's just like, oh wait, they're not in the same place what happened to all these bad guys? So it's like, there's like a Nazi with like a, a swastika monocle 
that Mike Mignola said he just liked it because it looked funny or cool. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that character ever appears again in like the Hellboy car- comics, but um, no, he yeah, just has, like, in the in the trade I was reading, it talks about how he committed he's committed to an asylum and then just died uh, having been eaten from the inside out by beetles. <laughs> yeah. It's just like those okay, kinds of, I asides, guess we're not seeing yeah. him again. <laughs> yeah. Um, those kinds of asides happen a lot in Hellboy books and BPRD books, which are always fantastic. Mm. Um, but yeah, like it's the opening of the, ser- the series kind of bucks the traditional action, uh, action sequence that you would expect from a, like a comic book or an action movie or something like that, where it's just like, Oh no, he appeared hundreds of miles away. And then it just jumps, uh, 50 years into the future and Hellboy is all grown up. Um, yeah. And like uh, professor Brutenholm or most like, as Mignola says, it's supposed to be pronounced broom. Um, He's kind of a not an afterthought in this opening of the story, but he's like he's introduced and then he shows up once it catches up to like the early 90s or mid 90s when the, the book was initially supposed to take place. And then he just well, he dies mm-hmm. like he's um, and it's just like, oh, yeah. OK. And they just kind of gloss over the their whole history Um but he comes back in a big way again, like talking about earlier, like it, it's, it's seeding a bunch of stories uh, really early on, uh, which was really, really cool. I, I think the one thing about the films, especially like, I don't really, I mean, as, as much as I like the guy from stranger things and I thought, Oh, it's actually pretty decent casting for a new Hellboy. boy. Uh, like the movie is just such a hot mess. I'm just like, eh, <laughs> not worth it. But the del Toro adaptation it's about, I think, as well, you know, because it involved the comic creators in the creation of the story. I mean, there's certain liberties that have to be taken for the the medium. And they have a two hour window ish to, to this is like before the three and a half hour cinematic snooze fest that we get today. But we we had to condense a lot of stuff, but also establish stakes much more early so i think that's why we get the um the much more in-depth relationship with professor broom and we get the the setting up of liz as a new member and everything as opposed to being an established member it's to introduce people a little bit more readily um Mm. but yeah i mean there's not a lot of action for like the first two issues um it's not until like issue three that we really well i mean not not entirely true sorry issue two we get the introduction of the brothers um who who or or issue one we get one small action sequence with the frog man um and then yeah yeah, and then it, it comes back again towards the end of issue two but it's like you know, in the in the film, you have this big subway scene out of the gate kind of thing. Whereas with this, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, it's 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 not until really towards the end of the the four issues that you get a lot of the superhero shenanigans that you would expect from a lot of comic books. There's almost like a a noir vibe um, with the with Seed of Destruction, which I think comes from. John Byrne doing the uh, the dialogue uh, for the first mm-hmm. series. It's a very different vibe from the rest of the series because there's a first person narrative that doesn't exist or appear really anywhere else within the Hellboy stories. Like you get Hellboy's internal dialogue uh, in in Seed of Destruction, which it doesn't really happen again. Uh, it's he's very much like. Ah, crap and that's the most inner dialogue you get from him from then on out but like it i and it almost feels like what frank miller was trying to do with sin city where it was just be like these large dialogue boxes mm-hmm. of just rambling um and that doesn't feel quite the same tone but yeah it's got a very almost noir vibe to it um now 
I think yeah. for the first series, it was almost necessary to help establish everything um, to kind of set up the world. But that, yeah. again, that once burn leaves, uh, that disappears, that, that kind of narrative form almost. And one of the things um, is like, even though this is um, like very dense, uh, exposition and and using that sort of noir technique it's not overwhelming like i we during the first season of the show the podcast we did x-men number one um you know which is you know claremont's yeah uh, sort of reboot with blue and gold team and it that was so just walls and walls <laughs> and walls of text it was like there was so much text at points it interfered with the artwork and it yeah. never feels like that <laughs> i mean i think because if this there's a lot of this that doesn't fuse the standard comic paneling format like you know you'll have a banner image of hellboy crouching and then like a quarter page panel and then two two like eighth of a page panels on a page so he just plays with the page in a way that gives you room to have this dialogue and have this exposition but not feel overwhelmed yeah and the, that goes back to like his art style like there's a big thing with with artists in comics where it's like you don't want to waste space because you only have so much room to tell a I guess nowadays it's like 22 page story. Um, Mignola kind of revels in the empty space. Like he is all about negative space. Um, and it, nowhere, nowhere more so than, than here. Like there's just a comic or there's sorry. There's just a panel uh, where it starts to rain frogs and it's just negative silhouettes of frogs for one panel. And then just a single frog for the next panel. And that's, that's not usually done in a comic book. Um, and that comes like you're saying with, with Claremont, um, he is so wordy, uh, that, yeah, it's almost a fight for space between whoever's illustrating and whoever is writing it. Like Claremont and, and Jim Lee, or they're just like, Jim Lee is so big and bombastic. And then Claremont is so, so verbose that it's just like, it's all, yeah, it's overwhelming at times. This doesn't have that. And I mean, and what I found so effective too is, at least for these four issues, is they really establish a relationship with the character right away. Like you actually, like Liz is not in it very much um, in the lead up, but you you have that 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 relationship. It's clear that there's something between her and Hellboy. There's it's clear that Abe and and Hellboy are friends and buddies, you know, and it's, it, it doesn't take long to, to get to that, that place, but it doesn't feel rushed at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, everything like, yeah, for, for a four issue story, it feels very dense without being a slog. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. well, hell, I mean, there are some writers who will try to take, 12 issues to tell the same kind of story and it's like super decompressed storytelling and it's just like um Mignola has an interesting balance because he's like he can tell what would feel like a big story in very small space but he can still do a splash page here and there and it's just like it doesn't feel like wasted space yeah it's it's very cinematic in a lot of ways i find like it's it, it it's does it's not like storyboarding but it, it you can imagine this happening in your head so easily <laughs> as if it was something that was just on the screen even though it's not um well since we brought it up the the films how did you feel about the adaptation um so for the Guillermo del Toro ones, when I first watched them, I absolutely loved them. The first one feels like the right kind of balance between Mignola and Guillermo del Toro, where the second one is almost pure Guillermo del Toro. Like Golden Army is almost mm -hmm. pure Guillermo del Toro. 
um, with like the clockwork gears and, and the fairies and all that kind of stuff. Um, the less said about the, <laughs> yeah. the most recent one, uh, probably the better. Uh, but um, there is a magic to that first Hellboy movie. Um, it, it feels it's it was done relatively inexpensively. It was like shot in Prague, which was like the f- perfect kind of place. There was a lot of love into that one. Um, you could tell Mike Mignola was having a blast. You could mm-hmm. tell Guillermo del Toro was having a blast. Um, whereas the the most recent, I, Alan Taylor, I want to say, as the director. Um, yeah, I think so. He, yeah, he, there was so much studio interference. Um, that he kind of like just Alan Taylor, whose heart wasn't into it. Uh, David Harbour is trying his best to carry the film. Um, they had some great people, but uh, what's his face as he, uh, as Professor Broom was not a great casting. Um, oh crap, what's his name? Ian McShane was not a great Professor Broom. Whereas like, um, yeah, William Hurt was William Hurt. I always get the two hurt actors yeah. mixed up. Yeah, he was the yes. perfect. The one that was in Doctor Who. <laughs> yes, yeah, the War Doctor. Yeah, he was the perfect. Yeah, uh, Professor Broom. Um, yeah, he captured that kind of like. Yeah, he he just had that that world weary element, right? Like, yeah, like, just, he's like he's he's still very British. He's still very um, proper, but he's seen some shit. Um, like he's he's faced demons he's yeah he's s- stared at the void directly and he's still like i'm gonna have a spot of tea before before bed but whereas like ian mcshane's just like i'm grumpy all the time and i and that's not broom that wasn't that's <laughs> not broom um i will say though the no. the wild hunt arc that they included in the most recent one i really liked along with the baba yaga um, see, I think my biggest problem with the most recent Hellboy movie is felt like a lot of discordant parts. Like they were trying to adapt to one too many things, um, and they just didn't fit. Like they were chapped, they were attacking or attacking, excuse me, adapting the Wild Hunt, uh, Storm and Fury, uh, the Baba Yaga storyline, um, and then there's just like hardcore horror stuff mixed in. And then even bits of Seed of Destruction is mixed in there too. And it's just like, you either have to have. It feels very much. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah. You have to ease people into. You either have to ease people into Hellboy's universe, like Guillermo del Toro did, or with the one that's coming out soon, then there's a new adaptation of. um, Oh, God. I'm blanking on the name of the story. Um. The Smiling Man? Oh, God, I'm, I am. That's a terrible. But there's a new adaptation that's like a direct adaptation of a single Seriously. Hellboy. St- Sorry? The Crooked the crooked Man. The Crooked Man. Thank you. Yes, I was thinking The Smiling Man, but I knew that wasn't right. Um, the Crooked Man story, which is like a one and done story. And they're pretty much just ignoring everything else. Like, it's almost like you're just expected to know that Hellboy exists. And people are totally okay with seeing a six foot six giant red ape of a man with a stone hand. And that's how the comics are in general. Like you, people will talk to Hellboy and not react. Whereas like in real life, it'd be like, holy crap, there's a giant demon talking to me, but that he's just, he's just one of the guys. And I think, (laughs) like I said, it's like you either go the one ease people in or you just accept it. You don't go just balls to the wall like Alan Taylor did in the, mm-hmm. in his adaptation. Um, so I think, I think that's yeah. probably my, my gripe about the most recent one. Yeah. I mean, it feels very much like when Sony starts interfering with the Spider-Man movie, um, like they, <laughs> they have like the good, good bones and then they're like, let's put venom in it. And, or yeah. let's, let's bring the sinister six in, in the next movie. And it's like, no, I mean, it could be sure eventually, but you've got to build to that, yeah. um, which is like why, you know, like counter like 
to the, to the opposite extreme, Marvel's Spider-Man movies work because they're like, we're not going to retell the origin story. We're just going to move forward and we're going to let this evolve and go from there. Uh, and yeah, I feel exactly. like that's why the, it, they took a, a page from Guillermo del Toro and, and we're like, you know, we don't need to, you know, tell the same story for a third time in a row or a fourth time in a row. Um, and yeah, I, it make makes for the much better film. Well, um, before we wrap up anything you else you want to share about Hellboy? Oh yeah. There's so much, there's so much great stuff with Hellboy. Like it's such a big connected universe. Go out and read Hellboy. If you love Hellboy, read the VPRD stuff. It's interesting because there's a, there's a, almost a definitive ending of the Hellboy comic, but then there's a second extra ending ending with the BPRD, excuse me, the BPRD series. Um, and Mignola is still cranking out uh, Hellboy universe stories. Like there are, uh, the most recent one was uh, Giant Robot Hellboy, which is like a, a great oh. Duncan Fragrato illustrated uh, kaiju robot Hellboy versus kaiju, uh, and it's fantastic. So just if you like see the destruction, um, just keep with it. You're you're gonna love of what comes next. Awesome. Um, and if people wanted to find your art, where can they look online? Oh, um, I am on Instagram, uh, Absence of Sky Studios. Um, don't have a whole lot up right at the moment other than some uh, spatterings of, of sketches here and there. But that's going to change over the next few months. Uh, I've got a few things I'm working on that I'm hoping to put out in the world. Um, yeah, so just check me out and stay tuned, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, Nick. Uh, it's been awesome. We'll have to have you back to talk about other comics and more about the Magnoliverse. I mean, uh, I'd love to get more more in deep with it. You've been listening to Detecting the Marvelous. Far From Here and showbizmonkeys.com co-production. Their producers are Dan Rosen, Matt Ardill, and Shahara Ghaznabi. Music by Glenn Bouchamp and art by Ben Steamroller. Thanks for listening and remember, true believers, Excelsior! Excelsior!